back to work. Yeah. So, okay, Elizabeth, uh, yesterday I like it very much, uh, your and Karsten definition of the fine surface area. So I'm very happy that you are going to continue to talk about it now. So okay, please. Thank you. Um, yes, so let me resume uh, where we were yesterday. Uh, or what, what, what's the situation that we are um, uh, looking at and how far we had come. So we still want to show, so, so, so the goal is to show this identity here. Um, that's still the goal. And um, we have realized several things already. Um, namely, we have realized if we want to show that for a general convex body K, which we want to do, then we may have a problem with the right-hand side because uh, what we have here is, uh, what we have here, if we uh, have a general convex body is not the usual Gauss curvature that we can put, but we have to introduce a notion of uh, what I called generalized Gauss curvature that we have to put on the right hand side. And um, maybe it helps um, to look again at this example that I gave yesterday, which shows that um, typically it will not be enough to uh, consider the, the usual Gauss curvature. We have to uh, take the notion of generalized Gauss curvature. And what was the example? When well, we were looking at the curve y equals x squared, and um, then we were looking at the boundary of a convex body, or if you wish at a function uh, that is convex, uh, but okay, let's stay with convex bodies. Uh, so then the boundary of um, our convex body was given by looking at the convex hull of the points plus minus one over n, uh, one over n squared for n in n. That is, we look at uh, those points here on the curve and take the convex hull. And uh, we keep doing that. Then uh, let's call the function that describes locally around zero, the boundary of this convex body, let's call this function f. Then we had already, um, I hope I convinced you that f is not twice differentiable in the usual sense uh, at, around uh, at zero, but f is twice differentiable in the generalized sense um, around zero. And uh, so, so maybe because, um, yeah, so maybe it helps if we write down for this example, the condition that we'd have to check in order to see that the function is twice differentiable at zero. So what do we have to check? Well, here, usually if we are in higher dimensions, we would put the Euclidean norm here, but here, um, because we are having a function F that goes from R to R, we'll just write absolute values. So we'll have, um, the sub uh, or L sub differential. So we look at all x that are in the interval one over n plus one, one over n. So all x here, and the, uh, we have to look at uh, the at sub differentials uh, of the function f at x minus the sub differential of f at zero minus this generalized second derivative um, at x, and then um, I have computed now. Uh, what is the subdifferential at such an x in this interval is easy to compute. It's just two n plus one over n n plus one, and then the uh, subdifferential uh, of f at zero because it's differentiable at zero is zero. So uh, now we claim that okay, this generalized second derivative at zero I claim is equal to two. So what we have to uh, show is that that expression here is smaller or equal than some function theta of the absolute value of x times the absolute value of x. And that is easy uh, and one can take theta uh, of the absolute value of x, for instance, equals to absolute value of x and that, um, that will work. So, so it is twice differentiable in this generalized sense uh, that I gave yesterday. And uh, this example shows that, okay, uh, even if the usual second derivative does not exist, this uh, second um, generalized derivative exists. Now that was just one point, so to speak, on the boundary of a convex body where we may have a problem if we only consider the standard uh, uh, second derivative or the uh, standard Gauss curvature. But as I said yesterday, we can construct a convex body K such that 
the boundary of K is not differentiable in the usual sense on a dense countable set. Uh, so I've indicated uh, this with those points. And th that means that the second derivative in the classical sense does not exist at any point in the boundary of K. Uh, so so uh, if we take such a, an arbitrary point on the boundary of K, this red dot here, and we zoom in, then if we zoom in, uh, we produce exactly such a picture or a picture that's similar to the example that we had in the previous page around zero. So we'll produce a, such a picture and we can produce such a picture for every point on the boundary of um, this body, which has this property. So. Um, uh, so, so we really, um, to emphasize this again, we need to uh, use this notion of generalized Gauss curvature, then the right hand side of what we want to show, that is this theorem here, also makes sense. And we are good with this generalized Gauss curvature because there is this uh, result by Alexandrov and Bonnison and Fenchel, with, which I also mentioned yesterday already, namely this says that, okay, the boundary of a convex body is twice differentiable in the generalized sense almost everywhere. And therefore, the uh, generalized Gauss curvature, as we had defined it yesterday, exists almost everywhere. So that's um, um, basically how far we had gotten. Actually, we had done uh, one more step, namely in our uh, attempt to prove the theorem, we had uh, shown that we can write this volume difference so we can write that as follows. Uh, uh, we can write that as the integral over the boundary of the body K. And then we will have the inner product of a boundary point with its outer normal uh, divided by N. I've pulled the delta under the um, integral already. Um, and then I just noticed, sorry, I've forgotten to write the limit on the right hand side. So the limit still outside of the integral. So that's the limit as delta goes to zero. And then we have uh, the integral over the boundary of K. I pull in the delta to the two of rem plus one. So as just now, we look at the inner product of the uh, point uh, of a boundary point with its outer normal um, and pull in this. And then that uh, we had uh, seen yesterday to the end, and we integrate, let me squeeze this here, uh, with respect to the usual surface area measured in UK. So, so we had written things like so, and what we would like to do is we would like to pull in the limit uh, under the integral. So we would like to interchange integration and limit. And as I had said yesterday, in order to do that, we need, um, we need a, a function, a dominated, a dominating, integrable function that is a function that dominates uniformly in delta and point-wise almost everywhere in X, this integrant that we have here now. And, uh, and if we have such a function, then we can apply the dominated convergence theorem and do the interchange of integration and limit. And the candidate for our, so candidate for our dominating function, wait for dominating, so that we are, can apply dominating convergence theorem, dominating integrable function uh, is uh, what we call the rolling function. So R of X, so, so it's a, a function R that goes from the boundary of K to R or R plus. And for a boundary point X, R of X is defined to be the soup over all a rho such that the ball uh, centered at X minus rho NX and has radius rho is contained in K. Uh, and that's supposed to happen if uh, NX, the outer normal is unique. And we put it equal to zero if NX is not unique. And uh, yeah, and then we had a, a theorem that I already stated also yesterday. So maybe I can squeeze this here. So the theorem, Elizabeth, sorry. So essentially, it is the only use of this rolling function, or there are others. Um, 
Well, we, we uh, noticed that we needed it for uh, this purpose and um, introduced it for this purpose, but mm -hmm. conceivably there are other uses. But uh, mm -hmm. at the moment, I, I don't know, uh, but conceivably there are other uses, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, because, you know, it's useful if you want to estimate kind of uh, what happens close to the boundary of a convex body. We'll see uh, uh, how we apply it uh, to actually, you know, prove this uh, this part up here. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I'll try to squeeze the theorem that I already stated yesterday. Uh, so that's Carson and me. So I'll uh, squeeze it here. So we had so k convex body in Rn, and we have some. Uh, we need to so that the scaling is right. We assume that the Euclidean unit ball is in here, but it's not important that it's well. There's always a ball with a certain radius in the uh, interior of a convex body, uh, and we assume that zero is in the interior of the convex body with loud loss of generality. So we know that there is a ball around zero uh, in the interior of the convex body, uh, uh, and we can assume <clears throat> just for scaling purposes that it's the unit ball. So it, it doesn't really matter, but uh, okay, if we assume it's the unit ball, then we have for all, uh, for all zero less or equal T less or equal one. So that uh, one, because we have Euclidean unit ball, we have what uh, several things, the set of all X in <clears throat> the boundary of K such that R of X is bigger or equal than uh, T. This is a closed set. And that implies that this rolling function is measurable, which we uh, need, uh, well, we need more measurability of the functions, not enough, but uh, we need integrability of, in a certain way. But uh, uh, to get uh, uh, that, uh, at least uh, for sure, it also should be measurable. So that's the first thing. And then the next thing is uh, the inequality, which is the most important most important part of this theorem, the measure uh, of the set of all those x, uh, like above <clears throat> in the boundary of k, such that r of x is bigger or equal than t. This is um, bigger or equal than one minus t to the n minus one times, uh, let me just write, instead of uh, writing uk of uh, the boundary of k, let me just write the n minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of k. And it will follow from this inequality uh, that uh, actually the uh, rolling function, uh, so the function uh, r to the minus alpha, this rolling function that I repeat goes from the boundary of k to r is integrable for all, all alpha, where alpha is between bigger or equal than zero and strictly smaller than one. Um, so what we had seen yesterday already is that the um, inequality is optimal. So inequality is optimal. And uh, the example that inequality is optimal was the cube. Um, unfortunately, my pencil died on me, but I guess you understood, um, and I hope it's not going to happen today that my pencil dies on me. So the inequality is optimal, and uh, that we had seen yesterday, and I want to uh, uh, also uh, emphasize here that uh, alpha cannot be taken equal to one, um, and the example, uh, so example of the cube, uh, so let's write it in short as I had done yesterday. Uh, for the L infinity ball, uh, let's just take uh, in dimension two. Um, so uh, the the example of the L infinity ball or the cube in dimension two shows that um, uh, alpha equals one is not possible in general. Um, okay, so why? Well, if we look at this example uh, of the cube, then uh, let's take a boundary. Let's take T and let's take a boundary point X. So this is T1, this boundary point. Then we see, okay, at that point R of X, the 
uh, um, rolling uh, function is actually equal to, uh, I had said t, so I had said t here, so it's actually one minus, so here is one, so it is one minus t. So if we integrate the rolling function, well, I'm not going to do the integration over the whole boundary, but uh, just over this part here, say. So if we integrate the rolling function over this part of the uh, boundary of the cube, uh, this corresponds to looking at the integral from zero to one. And then we want to look at the rolling function. So one minus T and uh, uh, we want to raise it now uh, to the power because we have written R to the minus alpha. So um, I, uh, alpha is equal to one means that if I want to show that this is not possible, then we have to look at this integral dt. And we of course see that uh, this is uh, ln one minus t and maybe a minus a t from a zero to one. And we see that this is not finite. So we see we cannot uh, in general take alpha equals one and the cube is an example for this. Um, right, so what I want to do now is I want to um, uh, give an, oh yeah, maybe so, um, um, yeah. So, so I want to, and maybe that's a, a kind of answer to your question. <clears throat> it's not uh, exactly, uh, you know, to your question that you just had now, Dima, it's not exactly mm -hmm. saying something about um, how uh, the R, the rolling function is uh, can be used for other situation, but it's saying something about how this inequality here, uh, this one, um, is actually uh, 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 useful uh, to uh, give us a, a quick proof of um, a corollary or. Uh, as a corollary of this inequality, we will get a, um, a result by Rademacher. So a corollary gives a result. Okay. By so what is the result by Rademacher? Uh, this uh, result by Rademacher says that, um, and let me now write mu k instead of just using the parallel bars because then uh, I'm not uh, so much in danger of forgetting it. So let's formulate it this way. So um, mu k, um, the usual surface area measure of the set of all x in dk in the, in the boundary of k so that n of x is unique is unique this is actually all of the boundary that is the outer normal exists uniquely almost everywhere on the boundary this is what this result of Rademacher says um, and I want to uh, um, say that uh, um, <clears throat> that this, uh, the measure of this set is equal to the measure of this set of all x in the boundary of k for which r of x is strictly positive. And uh, I think we, I had written something like so yesterday where I had forgotten to write the, um, uh, the measure and I had written just the sets and I'd forgotten to write the measure. So- Oh, yes, yes. So yes, I, yeah, so, so I really should not always use these parallel bars, but really write in UK, then I am less likely to forget. <clears throat> so let's see that we can get this as an immediate corollary, this Rademacher result. Uh, so Rademacher result is of course the first part here, but uh, we will see in the process of proving it that actually we also have this equality here. So let's see how we get this. Um, so uh, we um, of course have that, um, so let, let's write it. So now we are looking at the sets, the, the set of all X in the boundary of K for which we'll have that R of X is strictly bigger than zero. This is of course contained in the set of all X so that NX is unique. Right, because if we have, um, positive, uh, uh, if we have such a X in the boundary where we have this ball that uh, is in there, then uh, the outer normal to the ball is also an outer normal to the body. So we have this, but not the other way around. And I had even given an example um, that we can't have the other way around. That was the example. So uh, this is no. And the example that I had given was actually uh, this one uh, to the four over three. Okay, so 
so let's now prove our corollary. So we know that, of course, uh, the um, uh, n minus one dimension volume of the whole uh, boundary of the body is bigger or equal than um, the set of all x, uh, for which we are we are having uh, that uh, n of x is unique. Oh, and now I forgot again. Sorry, I forgot again to write the. Uh, I forgot again to write the. Mu k. Okay, so now it's there, and that by uh, above, this is bigger or equal than mu k of the set of all x, for which we'll have r of x is bigger or equal than zero, uh, is bigger than zero by above, and that is the same as uh, mu k of the union of all those sets where we have that r of x is bigger or equal than one over uh, little k, where k goes from uh, one to infinity. Now it's unfortunate uh, that we are at the end of the, at the bottom of the page, uh, but uh, what can I do? So I'll turn. Um, so uh, that is the same. So I write the last. Uh, so this is, we had mu k of the union, little k goes from one to infinity. Uh, the set of all x, r of x is bigger or equal than one over k. And, um, and then um, by, um, maybe I should say, bigger than one over k. And then, um, and, and that is the same. So by continuity of measure, of the measure, um, and because those sets are nested, that's the same as the limit as k goes to infinity of what? Mu k of the individual sets. So r x bigger than one over k. And um, now comes our inequality. So that is bigger or equal than limit as k goes to infinity. Uh, so now comes the inequality of the theorem. So this is bigger or equal than uh, one minus one over k to the n minus one uh, volume, n minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of k. And that is of course equal to the boundary of k. And we've started out with a boundary of K here, and uh, we end up with a boundary of K here. So we have to have equality all the way through. So in particular, we have to have equality uh, uh, here, um, which uh, shows that equality here. And yeah, so everybody then is equal to the N minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of K. So that is an immediate consequence of our theorem. Mm of our theorem, this result by Rademacher. Now, what I want to do next is uh, I want to show that um, the inequality, this inequality here implies uh, the integrability uh, for this range of alpha of the, um, of the uh, rolling function. So uh, uh, we show now, now we show, Uh, the rolling function R, um, R to the minus alpha to the minus alpha is integrable for, for zero less or equal alpha, less or, le strictly less than one uh, is integrable on the boundary of K. Um, so uh, the case alpha equals zero is trivial, there is nothing, there is nothing to do because we all just get uh, one. We already noted that um, because the set of all x where rx is bigger or equal than t because this is a closed set, uh, this gave us uh, that um, the function, the rolling function is measurable. So r to the minus alpha will also be uh, measurable. So r is measurable. 
by the first part of the theorem. So uh, assume that we have already shown. So this means that R to the minus alpha is measurable. Okay. Now um, let's now take uh, again the inequality of our theorem. So uh, the inequality of our theorem said that one minus T to the N minus one times the N minus one dimensional volume of the boundary of K is smaller or equal than the set of all X in the boundary of K for which we all have that R of X is bigger or equal than T. I, I forgot again to write mu K, so sorry about that. Uh, and to make things shorter, let me write uh, like so. So that's now supposed to be mu k or the n minus one dimensional uh, uh, surface measure. And um, so, so that was the uh, inequality of the theorem. Now we want to bring in, of course, our functions um, or uh, our functions r to the minus alpha and not just r. So that's the n minus one dimensional uh, volume of the set of all x in the boundary of k for which we are having that r of x to the minus alpha is smaller or equal than t to the minus alpha. So nothing has happened. Uh, but now what we will do, we make a change of variable, uh, or change of variable exaggerated. Uh, we put, uh, uh, so now we put, uh, uh, one over t to the alpha or t to the minus alpha, we put that equal to s and uh, rewrite everything, rewrite this inequality here in s. So if we rewrite the inequality in s, then one gets uh, one minus, so uh, t uh, is equal to s to the minus one over alpha. And uh, here we'll have n minus one, the boundary of k is smaller or equal than uh, the set of all x. I forgot again, um, for which we will have that R of X to the minus alpha is smaller or equal than S. Okay, so I just changed uh, the T, uh, uh, I just put uh, S equals to T to the minus alpha. And then now I'm going to uh, write uh, this uh, as, uh, I'm going to look at the complement of that set. So this, volume n minus one dimension volume is the same as the volume of the whole uh, uh, boundary minus the complement. So the set of all x for which we will have that r of x to the minus alpha is smaller than s. Um, no, greater. No, <laughs> not, of course not, uh, not smaller because it's bigger than s, of course. Okay, so uh, so we have kind of brought in, or we have brought in the distribution function of our uh, function of our rolling function. Um, from here we get, so from here we will get that the measure of the set of all x in the boundary for which we have that r of x to the minus alpha is bigger than s. This is smaller or equal than. Uh, the uh, n minus one dimension volume of the boundary of K, uh, one minus, and then we have one minus S to the one over alpha and uh, to the n minus one, this. And that is more equal. Now here we use Bernoulli inequality. So we'll get that this is, so Bernoulli inequality says that one minus S to the minus one over alpha to the n minus one, this is bigger or equal than one minus n minus one s to the minus one over alpha. That's what Bernoulli inequality tells us. So by uh, uh, this, we'll get that this is more or equal than, so one goes away and then we end up with uh, this s to the minus one over alpha. So this means, so that means then if we now look at the integral over the boundary of K, of r of x to the minus alpha uh, d mu k of x. This is the same as the integral um, s goes from zero to infinity of uh, what? Uh, of the, uh, uh, the distribution function for this function. So the volume of uh, n minus one dimensional volume of uh, 
um, the measure of all x so that r of x to the minus alpha is bigger than s um, ds. I have written everything. And um, uh, then I'll split up this integral. Uh, so I'll split up this integral as a first part where s goes from 0 to 1. Same thing, x um, r of x to the minus alpha is bigger than s ds plus uh, s goes from 1 to infinity. Same thing, x r of x to the minus alpha is bigger than s ds. And the first part, I'll simply estimate. Uh, so the first part there, I'll simply estimate the um, measure of all those x uh, in the boundary so that r of x to the minus alpha is bigger than s. That I estimate simply crude, uh, very crudely by the whole uh, um, surface area of the body times 1 plus. And now comes what we had done here. Uh, we use the uh, estimate above. So that is smaller or equal uh, than the integral s goes from one to infinity. And then uh, maybe I'll write the n minus one outside the integral as well. So we use our, uh, so we use our estimate here and um, then uh, can pull out the n minus one and we'll end up uh, s goes from one to infinity. And we have to integrate s to the s to the minus one over alpha ds. And we will see again, if alpha is equal to one, we have a problem that uh, uh, then we will run into trouble because the logarithm function will come in again. But if s, uh, but if alpha is strictly smaller than one, we will simply get uh, the volume n minus one dimensional volume or surface area of the boundary of k. And then we'll have one plus uh, n minus one. So if we do the integration, uh, we'll get alpha to the over one minus alpha. And again, we will see in that expression, if alpha would be equal to one, we would have a problem. So um, yeah, so that shows, um, so this shows that, um, this shows this part of our theorem uh, that, okay, from this inequality here, from this inequality here, we'll get that the function is uh, indeed integrable. And, um, and that will be crucial for the next step uh, in the proof of our theorem. Now to prove this, this theorem that I just mentioned about the rolling function, uh, that is we still have to, so, so the main thing that we have to prove there is the inequality. Um, and in order to do that, what one does is one proves the inequality first uh, when k is a polytope, and then the general case follows by approximation uh, by polytopes. I'm not going to do that now because I want to finish uh, the proof of our first theorem. So, um, so where are we with our first theorem? So we are, uh, yeah, so we, we are looking at, uh, okay, maybe I write it again. So we are looking at uh, that now that we have rewritten as uh, this integral. And now I'll uh, state a lemma, uh, which says there exists an absolute constant C that's positive and uh, delta zero um, such that for all X in the boundary of K with uh, R of X strictly bigger than zero. And from what I, we just proved in the corollary, we have seen that almost everywhere on the boundary of, uh, the, of a convex body, this happens that R of X is bigger than zero. Um, and for all delta with zero smaller than delta, smaller than delta zero, we have that these expressions, that is the functions that we have now under the integral so th those are bounded 
those are bounded by this absolute constant C times our rolling function raised to the power n minus one over n plus one. So this is good because the exponent here is an exponent um, that's uh, strictly smaller than one. So we know uh, the, the, um, uh, this function here is inter integrable on the boundary of K. Um, and the functions that we have here under the integral are uniformly bounded um, by this integrable function. So we can inter interchange integration and limit. So we'll get, if now we look at the limit as delta goes to zero of our volume difference, we can pull in the limit. So we'll get, so by the dominated convergence theorem and the lemma, we'll get that this is the now limit can be pulled under the integral of this expression. Delta and power n, power n. And the last lemma, and then, and then we will have a last lemma. And this last lemma will show that, um, so this is the last lemma, which will show that that expression actually converges uh, so that this limit here exists and it converges to Cn, this constant that I always denoted by Cn times the generalized Gauss curvature at the point x raised to the power n plus one. So there will be another lemma needed, which, which shows uh, that this limit exists and is exactly that. So if you wish, um, we could also use this expression here. So we could so, use- Sorry, and also integral. Uh, yeah, here, yeah, sorry. It's also integral. Here I just meant, you know, that term here. Ah, okay, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you wish, um, uh, we could, um, use this limit here, that is this thing here, we could use that as a definition of the generalized Gauss curvature as well, if we wanted. Good, so now uh, I want to say two words uh, about uh, uh, the proof of this lemma here, so that we see that how this rolling function comes in. So uh, I'm going to discuss now uh, I'm going to discuss now. And it is for x where n of x is unique or where the generalized curvature exists, for which x it converges? Oh, it's, mm, let me think for a second. Um, it is for this x where the generalized curvature um, mm -hmm. exists. Okay. But mm -hmm. this is almost everywhere by this. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? By Alexandrov's theorem, yeah. Exactly, by Alexandrov. Um, right, so um, what I want to uh, show is um, uh, an idea of the proof of this lemma uh, to, to give an idea how uh, this rolling function, what's the role of this rolling function or what, uh, what kind of role this rolling function uh, can play. So uh, a sketch of a proof of proof of first lemma, the first lemma, meaning the first lemma of the, of the previous page. Okay, so um, let's see. Uh, let's start with a picture. So um, we have um, uh, the boundary of our convex body and here, We'll have, let's pick a point uh, x on the boundary. So x such that r of x is strictly positive. So let's pick such a point. And um, let's also draw the outer normal in x. So r of x is strictly positive. Let's draw uh, the uh, rolling ball here. Here is the center of the rolling ball. And let's look at the case. So I'm only going to discuss a specific case. Uh, so let's discuss the case, uh, uh, case when 
Um, when it actually so happens that X delta sits nicely in this rolling ball. So what do I mean? So here is X. Sorry, I forgot. What is the first lemma? Oh, th th this lemma here, this lemma. So maybe I'll say lemma one. Ah, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So I want to show uh, this, uh, you know, that the expression under the integral, I want to show that it's dominated by this, uh, by the rolling function. So I want to show this inequality. Okay. So uh, the lemma is inequality or the lemma is uh, convergence? No, no, this, that, that, so, so, okay. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. So the lemma, lemma one finishes here, right? So that's the end of lemma one. Mm -hmm, yeah. So now uh, what we do is we look back at what uh, the theorem that we want to prove, right? Which is looking at that, limit, right? That's the theorem that we want to prove. The theorem involves looking at that limit, right? We know that this expression here, we could write like so, that we had already seen last time. Now, if we look at the limit, we have to look at the limit here, but by the lemma one, we can, so by lemma one, we can put the limit now mm -hmm, under the, mm -hmm. the integral, right? That's lemma one, which tells us that we can put the limit under the integral, right? Yes, yes. And then, and so then separately, we have to look at this limit here. And that is another lemma, so let's call it lemma two, which shows- And we still, and we still need to prove it, right? Yeah, this lemma two, we haven't mm -hmm. touched at all, so. And so it, it remains to prove two lemmas. Exactly. Am I right? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll start with lemma one. And I don't even know if I will have. Let's see what the, am I doing time wise. I don't even know if I have time to prove uh, lemma two. But um, yeah. So, but let's start with lemma one and see how it goes. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we uh, want to prove the lemma one. So um, so maybe I should then write lemma one. Um, so the setup is that for, as follows, we'll take a point on the boundary X um, such that R of X is uh, strictly positive. And we also, we have drawn the R of X and we draw the outer normal. Now I'll say, I'll do a sketch of the proof because there are actually several cases to consider. And we are only going to consider a first case when the namely the case when the X delta sits nicely in this uh, rolling ball. So, uh, so in which way should it sit nicely? So if here is our X and say somewhere here is zero, we know that um, X delta and X are, uh, or X delta, the X delta sits on the line segment that connects uh, uh, X to zero. And the case that I'm going to consider is that um, when the X delta sits, uh, say here, so um, X delta, let me do away the center. So X delta sits here. So that's the case we are going to consider. Um, in other words, like if I looked at, um, if I looked at, let's call this angle theta. So if I looked at, um, uh, let's say here is the center. And if I looked at, um, um, if I looked at this length here, which is, uh, so what's that? So we'll have cos theta is equal to, because angle is also here. So cos theta is, uh, how shall we call it? Uh, uh, how shall we call this L? Cos theta is L over X minus X delta. So we are, uh, wanting to consider this case when L, which is a cos theta X minus X delta is smaller. Um, okay, to be on the safe side, let's say smaller than R of X over two. So this, this is the only case that I'm going to consider. Then of course, afterwards, one would have to consider the case that this is actually bigger than R of X um, uh, the rolling function at x over two 
but uh, that's then this one's already kind of technical and that's also technical so let's stay with one technical issue concerning this lemma um okay okay Good. right so now um let's um look at so we know that x and x delta are collinear And I want to rewrite the expression. I want to rewrite this expression here. I want to rewrite a bit, which is which will be more convenient to work with. So uh, how do I rewrite? So as they are collinear, we know that the length or the norm of x is the same as the norm of x delta plus x minus x delta. So um, we see what comes in in our expression is this quotient uh, of x delta over x. So let's bring it in. So from this, it follows that this quotient that we are interested in, which is this one, um, is uh, equal to, so from this, we'll get that this is equal to x minus x delta over x. Because we want to see a little bit uh, more geometrically what this expression, what this expression here really means. That's uh, why I'm rewriting it. So, but now uh, we'll have to look at what we'll have to look at is actually x delta over x to the n, which is if I bring things to the other side. So it is one minus. Um, x minus x delta over x and this to the n and this is bigger or equal i use Bernoulli again and i think the uh, estimate in this direction is what we need so this by Bernoulli is bigger or equal than one minus n uh, x minus x delta over x so the uh, the, the uh, guy that we are really looking at is actually one, uh, the guy that we are really looking at is one minus this. So one minus x delta over x to the n is then smaller or equal than n x minus x delta over x, always the norm. And uh, actually we, uh, uh, we really also have um, this uh, yeah, let's write the end, then it goes away. So we have um, actually not only that, but also this term appearing. So this, uh, so I should write it, otherwise it's going to be confusing. Um, so we'll have actually here we look at, uh, and the delta we'll take care of in a moment, but now I'm just uh, looking at that term times the other term. So this times one minus x delta over x to the n. This is smaller or equal than, okay. Um, that's smaller or equal than um, um, what we have here. So we see that the n goes away and uh, we'll have x minus x delta. The n goes away, but then we'll have, then I would have to write uh, okay, so let's write it. So uh, I write like so, x, nx, I write like so. But this is exactly the cosine of this angle theta that I had written up here. So this is exactly uh, the cosine of this angle theta that I had written up here. And uh, up here, we had already seen that that quantity here I had called it L. Uh, so that guy here is exactly, so this guy here is exactly what we had called L up there. Right? Good. So now, um, now what's the, what's the idea? Um, so the idea now is, hmm. okay, so I'm debating, should I crowd this picture more or should I draw a new picture on the new page? Okay, let's draw a new picture on a new page. Um, 
So our setup is like so. We'll have x here without a normal nx. And we'll have um, our rolling ball. Um, 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 here, and we have chosen the case where we are actually with our x delta here, that is nicely within the ball. Now, what happens? Well, what happens is, um, and I stated that when we were discussing floating bodies, so we know x delta, as x delta is a boundary point, uh, X, as x delta is a point on the boundary of the floating body, there exists a hyperplane by definition of the floating body H that cuts off exactly delta, delta from K. So we know that there is such a hyperplane that cuts off exactly delta from K that uh, uh, we had mentioned when we were discussing the floating bodies. So we know uh, there is such a H that cuts off delta. That is, we know if this is H minus, we know that H minus into K has volume delta. Now we, now of course, and that's where this rolling ball uh, given to us by the rolling function is convenient. Uh, what uh, we now will do is we will estimate this uh, volume delta by looking at uh, what's happening when we cut off within this rolling ball. So we'll of course then have that the volume that's cut off by this hyperplane uh, H within the rolling ball will be smaller or equal than delta. Let's compute what we then actually get, but let's compute things in a uh, simplified situation, but which uh, uh, gives an idea uh, and the, uh, the uh, not so simplified situation, which I have drawn in the picture up here is just adding other uh, uh, more uh, technical difficulties. So let's look at the simplified situation. And what do I mean by the simplified situation? I mean, we are in uh, the case or the things, things are like so. So here we have our x and the nx. And um, we'll um, have our approximating, uh, not approximating, we have our rolling ball. And uh, here is the center. And here is, uh, do I want to draw that? Uh, here is our x delta. Maybe I'll draw it. So, what's the simplified situation? So, we look at, we assume, we assume that this hyperplane, that the hyperplane that cuts off delta uh, has. Uh, outer normal has also outer normal nx, which of course is absolutely not necessarily so. But just to explain the idea, let's uh, otherwise it's getting too technical. So just to explain the idea, let's assume that for the moment that is our hyperplane H, which in general, of course, looks something like so, is like so that it also has outer normal. Um, that it also has outer normal um, nx. Then wh what we have written already here, we'll have that delta, which is h minus into k, into k, and volume. Um, this is of course bigger or equal than if we look at the volume that h minus cuts off from this ball. So H minus intersected with this ball that is centered at X minus R X N X and has radius R X. 
Mm. Yeah. So what do we have here? So this guy here, um, this is actually the volume of a cap. Let me write it in short of a ball with radius Rx. And height, uh, so the height of this cap is um, this thing here. And what had we called it? So that's exactly this thing here that we had called L in the previous uh, page. So L. So what we have to do is we have to com compute volumes of such caps of Euclidean balls with radius R. And this we can do easily. And I guess it will be enough to just have the estimate from below. So the volume of a cap, so let's write down in general, with radius R of a Euclidean ball with uh, height L. This is bigger or equal some constant it's, it's one can uh, actually specify pretty, so this is, an abs this is not an absolute constant, it's a constant that depends on N. And uh, uh, one can actually pretty uh, specify pretty well uh, 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 what it is, um, but um, we, we don't need it now, it's a constant that depends on N and then, um, what else uh, comes in is the radius raised to the power n minus one over two times the uh, n minus one dimensional volume of the n minus one dimensional Euclidean unit ball and L to the n plus one over two. So uh, that's what we get. And um, as I said, uh, one can pretty much, actually one can pretty much determine, I, I could even, I should even write something like so, uh, this is proportional to, and this C, uh, as I said, depends on N, uh, but it's not important to us. Uh, it's something like two to the N plus one over N, something of that sort, let me check. Um, two to the N plus one over two, I, as I have written it, I should write it. So this this thing here is something like two to the n plus one over two over n plus one. But it's not important. We'll just need. Um, it's not important now. It would actually be extremely important. So to have precise estimates for the volume of the caps of such caps becomes extremely important. Um, if uh, we prove the lemma two, there we need uh, there, there we need really uh, the um, precise nature of this constant that depends on n. But uh, for the lemma one, uh, it's not so crucial. So if we continue uh, from the previous page, we'll get that delta is bigger or equal than now comes the volume of the cap now. Um, where we look at the Euclidean unit ball with uh, radius um, r of x. So we'll get uh, a constant. Then we'll have r of x to the n minus one over two. And then we'll have um, this. And then we'll have um, L to the n plus one over two. So we'll get that L. So, so I, I, I'll solve for L. So we'll get that L is smaller or equal then. So we'll get uh, uh, one over C, the N minus one over two, uh, two over N plus one. And then we'll get uh, R of X to the minus N minus one over N plus one, which is good. Um, and then we'll get Delta to the two over N plus one. But now recall that the L, uh, which was um, here, so we um, have the, our L here, that was bigger or equal than the quantity we are interested in, which is this one. So we'll see that L is, or we saw that L is bigger or equal than this quantity here. Uh, So 
So in total, if I now bring the delta two or delta to the two over n plus one to the other side, we'll get so we'll get that the quantity we are interested in, which was this one. This is small or equal, then comes a constant. I'll call it just C again, times R of X to the minus N minus one over N plus one, which is exactly, so this is exactly what we claim in the lemma. This is exactly what we claim in the lemma. So we have proved the lemma in this specific case where- uh, uh, Sorry, uh, where did we use that L is at most R over two? so that we can nicely work uh, so that we can nicely work within this uh, uh, within this ball and so they use the approximate formula for the cap right exactly for the volume for volume of the cap exactly. okay uh -huh. yeah but um, uh, and so so we have uh, you know uh, proved it in this sim where we made these two simply, well, where we looked at this case first. The other case that is when this is not happening, that we have this condition uh, can be done uh, similarly uh, uh, using uh, geometric arguments. And, um, and then uh, we have moreover simplified the situation where we assume that the outer normal of the hyperplane that cuts off delta has the same uh, outer normal as, uh, as um, as in the point X, uh, but but uh, to do to do do the general case just adds on additional technicalities and doesn't give any further insight um, insight of the proof. So now, why am I doing time wise? Um, I'm not doing good time wise. So I'm going to skip uh, to give. Um, uh, a sketch of the proof of lemma three. I'm going to skip that. Um, so let's assume. Uh, lemma two. You mean. Uh, lemma two, sorry. Um, so I'm going to skip this because I don't, I only have uh, like 20 minutes or so. Uh, so I'm going to skip this, but that's, and that then finishes the proof. As I said, uh, to do, to prove lemma two, uh, one has to be much more delicate. So just maybe to say one word about it. Um, one has to be much more delicate how one uh, treats the boundary of a convex body. And what one uses is that almost everywhere on the boundary, um, in, uh, the boundary can be approximated by an ellipsoid or an elliptic cylinder. And then we do the cutting off uh, uh, with hyperplane delta, bringing in the boundary of the uh, floating body uh, doing similar things that we have done just now, that is uh, estimating uh, H, inter, H minus inter K, which uh, has volume delta, estimating that not within uh, K, but within an approximating um, ellipsoid or approximating cylinder. Uh, and that's much more delicate than what I had indicated in lemma one. So let's not do this and uh, let's uh, just uh, finish. So I want to finish this part. So that was the first part I'm floating. I'm uh, sorry, well, what you have said now is that uh, in your proof, uh, actually you approximated not by the balls, but by the ellipsoids. Um, one knows that- um, Ah, well, you just take, uh, take a fine transformation or something, yes? You could the body. a fine transformation. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then uh, it's known that uh, the boundary of a convex body in every boundary point, uh, uh, almost everywhere on the boundary, uh, the convex body can be approximated either by an ellipsoid or an elliptic cylinder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. As well as we wish, so we have to uh, say what we mean by as well as we wish. Uh, and then like we had done the computations for our rolling ball, um, we will do similar computations um, now within this 
really approximate because the rolling ball this is not really approximating necessarily it sits it maybe somewhere so, uh, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. you don't know how much you lose right if you um cut off uh, yeah. and only estimate within here so you don't know how much you lose from your delta you lose all that and that may be a lot uh, in the other lemma one has to be much more careful and really approximate well the body actually from the outside and from the inside, it can be done um, for delta small enough, which we now can assume for delta small enough because we look at the limit as delta goes to zero. So we approximate well by an ellipsoid or an elliptic cylinder, and that can be done almost mm -hmm. everywhere in the boundary of the convex body. And then we'll uh, do, uh, you know, our estimates similar to what we had just done now. Um, by uh, okay, I, I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. computing within this ellipsoid or elliptic cylinder, and we see that okay, so so this approximating ellipsoid or the approximating uh, uh, elliptic cylinder is of course related to the Gauss curvature of this point on the boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so, but I wanted to finish this section. Uh, um, uh, that is the first part, which was on, on floating bodies and um, affine surface area. I wanted to finish that with uh, giving a few uh, extensions and raising a few open questions that, um, yeah. And then come to the next part, uh, I guess tomorrow, which is uh, on approximation of convex bodies by polytops and uh, um, to random polytops. So to finish, so that would be, I guess, one, three. Uh, um, uh, other uh, other directions and um, uh, open questions and uh, I'd be happy of course if, if uh, you know so I raise some open questions I'd be happy if anybody uh, you know wants to know more about the open questions and wants to uh, get in touch with me I'd be happy to uh, you know uh, discuss this um, if somebody is interested in those open questions. So let me write one last time uh, this. Oh, let me write one last time this um, formula that we have. Uh, so the limit as delta goes to zero of this volume difference. Let me write like very short, like so is equal to Cn, and then comes this integral over the generalized Gauss curvature. Now, so we had proved this, where we have this generalized Gauss curvature. Now, um, well, first thing is we had seen, so, so this is our affine surface area of K, um, and we had seen that the affine surface area of a polytope is equal to zero. Um, that is, we had understood that the left-hand side uh, when we have a polytope is equal to zero because um, almost everywhere on the boundary of a polytope, the Gauss curvature or generalized Gauss curvature is equal to zero. So left-hand side we immediately see is equal to zero. Now let's look at, uh, uh, let's have a closer look in the case of polytopes to the left-hand side. That is this volume difference. And I want to look at the, uh, and of course the left-hand side is also zero. But uh, let's look uh, more closely what actually happens here. So let's take the example of the L infinity unit ball, the cube. So let P be now the polytop in dimension two, which is just, you know, our usual L infinity unit ball. And let's, uh, so zero here, one here, one here. And let's compute this volume difference in that case. Uh, I had already told you that the boundary of the floating body is given by the function one minus delta over two one minus x, um, and uh, x go, uh, runs between uh, yeah x runs between zero and um, so x runs between zero and delta over two. Uh, uh, okay, what do I mean? I, I only want to consider it in this first quadrant here. So I only look at it in the first quadrant. So uh, one minus delta over two. So one minus delta over two, right? Because uh, if we look at uh, where we stop, uh, which is here, uh, for instance, that hyperplane cuts off delta. So we will see that, okay, what's this uh, height here, uh, H? 
So we will see that delta is equal to times uh, H. So the H is uh, delta over two. That's why we stop here. Um, now let's look at um, uh, V to infinity, the volume minus V to infinity delta. So, okay, so let's, okay, I guess um, I multiply by four. So if I write the whole thing, so then we'll have a one minus. So then I'll have to look at the integral. Uh, I said X goes from zero to one minus delta over two, uh, one minus delta over two, one minus X and DX. And we can compute that. So let me just give you the result uh, because that's easy to do. Uh, what one gets is actually two delta one plus log two plus delta uh, log one over delta. So this is what one gets if one uh, uh, integrates this out. So then obviously, um, if we would divide here by that quantity here, what we usually do. So if we divide here by delta, so now we are in dimension two, so we divide by delta to the two over three. Um, let me, uh, so that I don't have to divide here. Uh, let me just do this. So we will divide by delta to the two over three. Then we see, of course, um, that um, I forgot something. I forgot a crucial thing, namely there is a delta here. Let me see if I uh, uh, got that now right. Yes, uh, I got it right. So, um, so we see if we divide by delta to the two over n plus one, which as we are in dimension two is delta to the two over three, then we will simply get that this is equal to zero. So the left-hand side is also also zero. But maybe that's not, uh, that's not the right thing to do in case of polytops. Maybe in the case of polytops, we uh, should divide by uh, this term here instead. So maybe in the case of polytops, we should look, and in particular in the case of the L infinity unit ball, we should look at, um, so here is the volume difference we should not divide by delta to the two over three, but we should divide by delta log one over delta. And then this will go as uh, delta goes to zero, this will actually go to two. So we'll get a limit that's different from zero if we divide by uh, the right quantity in the expansion of the volume difference. And, um, and so if you want, one could, okay, let me formulate the next theorem. And then I say what one wants, what could do. So, um, so that was done not only for the uh, L infinity unit ball in dimension two, but it gives you an idea uh, of, uh, of the next theorem, which is due to Carson should, which uh, says that, so P is a polytop in Rn, then, if one looks at the limit as delta goes to zero of the volume of P minus the volume of the um, uh, floating body of the polytop and one divides by delta uh, log one over delta to the N minus one, that is in the case when N is equal to two, we'll just get uh, one as above. So this limit Carsten showed exists and is equal to the number of flags of P of the polytope P divided by um, N factorial N to the N minus one. So it's related to the combinatorial structure of the boundary of the polytope. Uh, so what is a flag, where a flag um, of P uh, is an N tuple. Uh, F0, F1, up to Fn minus one, where each Fi is an i-dimensional phase of P. And uh, 
And moreover, we have that F0 is contained in F1, is contained and so on, is contained in Fn minus one. So uh, to uh, see in the above example, where we looked at the cube uh, uh, in dimension two, um, we will see that, okay, what are the flags here? Well, we will have to look, we will have to start with the zero dimensional faces, which are, are of course just the vertices. So we will get, uh, we have four vertices, but to each vertex. Um, uh, so let's see uh, what's a flag that corresponds to this vertex. So a flag, one flag that corresponds to this vertex is we start here and we take uh, that n minus one dimensional face. So that is that edge. And another um, flag would be we start here and we uh, take uh, that um, uh, edge. So to each vertex correspond to um, uh, such n tuples or such uh, tuples. So we will get that the number of flags is equal to eight. So number of flags is equal to eight. Uh, but then we'll have to divide by, so we'll have to divide by, I'm not doing this, so we'll have to divide by um, n factorial, which we are in dimension two, is two, uh, and uh, another two from here, so we'll have to, to divide by four, which gives us exactly, sorry, which gives us exactly these two up here. Okay, so that's nice. Um, and Sorry, maybe I... maybe we have to divide by the volume the left hand side or, or something like this. Uh, no, uh, no, no, really? no, that's, that's fine. But, but if we uh, scale our polytope, the left hand side will scale also, right? Mm. But in this scaling, delta will also, will also scale, maybe, and that's why the delta, that's will why also, delta here. Uh, the here. delta will also scale, and actually now uh, absolutely right, and the mm. delta will scale mm. now because it's not having. Yeah. Okay. The, okay. I see. Before yeah. it scaled with a, uh, it scaled with the determinant t to the n minus one over n plus one. But now yes, yeah, yes. Scales, it, we have a different power for the delta, so it scales probably right. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the, the result looks very nice. Yes, it is very nice. And actually, um, it, so we extended, so uh, we extended the result, so um, uh, extended, um, and definitely no detail. Uh, yeah, so in that case, different. So extended the result to spherical and hyperbolic space. Uh, and that was done by uh, Florian Bezel and Carsten Schütz and myself. Um, so because this whole concept of uh, floating bodies and uh, affine surface areas with Florian Bezau, I extended to spherical and hyperbolic space. Um, and, um, the, and in particular, also this result for polytopes, uh, we extended to spherical and hyperbolic space. Of course, one, if, we, if one is, for instance, in spherical space, uh, affine uh, doesn't make uh, uh, much sense anymore. So one, um, yeah, uh, we have to call it differently. Um, now, um, so how much time? Uh, oh, uh, so, so maybe I'll just mention one result which leads to a question. So that's the second thing that I wanted to uh, do is, um, so we have seen um, that, so, so we were looking at this volume difference, K, uh, 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 volume of K minus volume K delta, which I in short write so now. And for delta small, this behaves like, um, behaves like what? It behaves like delta to the two over n plus one, which we have seen also if K is smooth, 
I'm writing it like so. That is this. So if I want to look now at the expansion of the volume difference. So it behaves like so if K is smooth. And as we have just seen, it behaves like delta ln uh, one over delta to the n minus one if K is a polytope. Then uh, uh, a question, uh, suppose we have given a function, f uh, is given and f is concave and maybe has other properties such that uh, it sits between delta ln one over delta to the n minus one and this one, does there exist a convex body K such that, um, which will of course depend on F, such that um, the volume difference between this body is that function now. So that's the question. And um, we, the, we only know the answer answer in dimension two um, that is uh, uh, Carson and uh, myself. And we, uh, the bodies that realize that uh, we call uh, almost polygonal bodies. And what one gets is basically we get, we get uh, uh, this works so, 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 so works uh, for uh, F's. For f of delta uh, that look like um, delta to the beta, where uh, uh, beta is smaller or equal than a uh, bigger or equal than two thirds and smaller than one, because the decisive term here is of course the this delta term here. Um, so for such functions, given such functions delta to the beta with this exponent beta, we do find a convex body K um, F such that the volume difference between the body, this body and the floating, its floating body is given by that function. But we do not know anything in higher dimensions. And maybe one word and then I'll finish. Um, why do we call it almost polygonal bodies? The construction goes like, so we look again at this function y equals x squared, and then we'll take a sequence a, uh, one, a two, and so on, that converges to zero at a certain rate. And um, as before, uh, we'll take the convex hull of the points a i, a i squared. Uh, so we'll take the convex hull of those points I in N and uh, well, complete the picture to get a convex body. And, um, and we managed to compute the volume, uh, to, to compute firstly the floating body of such objects and then to compute the volume difference. And according uh, at which rate um, the sequence converges to zero, we will get uh, uh, the respective uh, uh, powers uh, of uh, delta where uh, that is this beta that sits between two over three and one. And uh, we call those polygonal bodies because they are not polygons or polytopes, uh, uh, but almost, uh, yeah, but almost. Okay, so I should finish. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Are there any questions? Um, I have one small question. Can you switch three pages back? I think. Yes, yeah. this one. And uh, 
uh, assume that we don't know this identity in the middle of the page, and we don't know uh, the result of Karsten about the polytops, and know only the definition of the floating body. So, uh, would it be uh, is it obvious that the left hand side, this limit for the polytops, is zero just from the definition? Is it obvious? Is, is it you easy? Mean, uh, uh, you mean if we have a polytop, is is yes. it obvious that this is zero? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, uh, if you divide by that quantity here, right? Yeah, yeah, by, by that quantity. Um, I can think of an argument uh, which uh, um, is one would have to do a little bit of uh, computation and thinking because okay, mm -hmm. what happens um, if what happens or what what would be the or how would I go about to uh, convince myself this, that this is so? If one has a polytope, I'd be looking at. Um, um, something that I said up here, we know that um, if we have a convex body, every point on the boundary can be, uh, or almost everywhere on the boundary, the body can be approximated by an ellipsoid or an elliptic cylinder. And in the case of a polytop, it would be, the, the relevant things would be the n minus one dimensional facets. And there we have approximation by an elliptic cylinder and that you know, with this uh, dividing by that quantity here would give us uh, the zero. Mm. And actually, it is the same maybe technique which Karsten used, uh, approximating with the cylinders. And... Uh, uh, no, no, not at no? all. You do something completely ah, okay. different because you, ah, have, you okay. have to get the right order. Uh, you really have to expand the, the volume difference here to get mm -hmm. uh, this order. Uh, what he does to, to prove to do that is he. Um, uh, takes a, a general uh, polytop and then he um, um, subdivides it into simplices and what he does do is he so that's a general polytop subdivides it into simplices and uh, he does explicitly the computation for a simplex mm -hmm. okay. and what is the decisive but thing for a simplex is uh, what we also see if we look at the um, at the cube is what happens in the corners of a simplex. Mm -hmm. This is where we pick up this, uh, this is where one picks up this, uh, you know, uh, volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I see. Uh, more questions? Okay, thank you very much again, Elizabeth and Zahar for today's lecture.